Hey, what's up guys? Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com. Let's talk about depersonalization. This is part two in my little two-part series on dissociative states. Last time we talked about derealization. Today we're gonna to talk about depersonalization. Uh, you may be watching on YouTube or listening as a podcast. Uh, yes, I am in my car driving. Uh, yes, it sounds funny if you're listening as a podcast episode. I am just really time constrained, so I'm going to squeeze these in when I can. Sometimes that will be in the car. So I apologize in advance for the quality, but hopefully I will do the best that I can and you'll get something out of that anyway. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, before I get into the specifics of depersonalization, and hang on, let me open the sunroof here, get a little light on the subject. Uh, before I get into the specifics of depersonalization, let's loop back, <coughs> excuse me, through um, some general issues regarding dissociative states because I think they're important enough to repeat. Uh, dissociative states exist on a continuum or a spectrum, and if you have ever had a friend or a family member have to poke you in the shoulder and say, hey dude, are you still with us because you're kind of zoned out off into your own little universe for 30 seconds, that's kind of daydreaming. We all know what that is. We've all had it happen to us. That is technically a dissociative state on the most mild, nondescript, don't give it a second thought end of the spectrum, right? No one's afraid of that because it happens to everybody. We know it's normal. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum are like the dissociative disorders. And if you are the type that is going to Google and research and read, and that's not a bad thing necessarily, but if you like to learn, uh, you will read some things that you may find frightening, disturbing, upsetting uh, on the other side of the spectrum. You'll read about dissociative disorders, some of which involves permanent or semi-permanent states of dissociation of varying types. And at least in my opinion, when you read these things, they do begin to slightly blur the distinction between psychosis and neurosis. So I understand why when some people read about this stuff, they get really freaked out, they get upset, they get afraid. Uh, but let me assure you of this. Uh, if you're watching or listening because you're dealing with things like panic disorder or agoraphobia or generalized anxiety disorder, then you are on the mild side of the spectrum and you can ignore that really scary stuff at the, at the other side, all right? Because for people like us, uh, dissociative states like derealization and depersonalization are just anxiety symptoms. They're nothing more and they're nothing less. They're no more dangerous or impactful than any other anxiety symptom. And we're going to just approach them and treat them the same way that we do all of our symptoms. So I will specifically tell you that forget that all the scary stuff that you're reading. You are not insane or crazy, nor will you become insane or crazy. You are not psychotic, nor will you become psychotic. <clears throat> excuse me, and you do not have a dissociative disorder for you, uh, your dissociative state, be it derealization or depersonalization is just simply an anxiety symptom, right? So it's, it's no more dangerous than anything else. I will admit that they are a bit more frightening sometimes, uh, a little harder to get a grip on, uh, but that doesn't make them actually dangerous. They're more frightening for us, but frightening doesn't mean really dangerous. So keep that in mind, please, uh, if you can really think about that, consider it and, and try and believe what I'm saying, because if you can buy into that, then it's going to save you just a ton of needless worry and fear that you don't have to have. So let's get into the specifics of depersonalization. And we're going to start with, what is it, right? Always the first question. What We're going to talk about, we're going to ask three questions. What is it? Why does it happen? And what can I do about it? So let's start with what is it? Well, the technical sort of clinical definition, the, the short version, is that it is a disconnection or a dissociation with one's sense of oneself. So... It is extremely hard to describe depersonalization, especially to someone who has not experienced it, without being very subjective and interpretive and using that dreaded phrase that I hate, it feels like. So I'll go through that for 10 seconds. The most common descriptions involve it feels like, and the most common phrases, and I used to use them too, are it feels like I'm not real, it feels like I'm no longer real, it feels like I'm not really present or here, uh, it feels like I am losing my mind or slipping away, it feels like I'm losing myself, it feels like I'm disintegrating. These are all the things that I used to say and most people say, if you ask what is the depersonalization, they will tell you that. Invariably, it will, somebody will say, it feels like I'm not real. Now, I hate feels like, I hate, hate, hate it, and I don't want us to use it. You kind of have to use it if you're going to describe the situation to somebody else to get them to understand. But let's adopt a, a better working definition for ourselves. And I'll start by saying that when we are awake and out and about living our lives, we have a perception of our environment. 
And that not only includes everything outside of our skin, but includes us because we're part of our own environment. So you do have a perception of yourself as a unique element in your environment. 99.9% .9 of the time, the processing of that perception happens in the background. It's a process that happens automatically on autopilot. I'm not going to say subconscious because that's a different connotation, but it's an autopilot kind of thing. We don't interact with that process. We don't consider it. We don't think about it. We don't worry about it. It's just kind of there, and our perception of ourselves just kind of gets melded into our overall perception of our environment uh, that we have all the time when we're awake. However, sometimes that changes. And instead of happening in the background automatically without thinking about it, suddenly that process comes to the foreground and we are aware of it, we think about it, we worry about it, we interact with the process that we don't normally interact with, and that's a foreign state. We're not used to feeling that way, we're not used to being that way, and that's what makes depersonalization de so weird, so strange feeling, such a foreign state to be in. But what that means is that our working definition of depersonalization is a temporary change in the way our brains process their perception of us. So for me, it is a temporary change in the way my brain is processing its perception of me. And I will augment that by stressing the word temporary and the, the word change. It's just a change in a state of being, uh, right? So change is not does not have a specific judgment attached to it. So remember, it's temporary and it's just different. It's not better or worse. It's not dangerous or not dangerous. It's not benign or life-threatening. It's just different. So it's a temporary change in a state of being. Uh, temporary change in the way my brain processes its perception of me. So I really urge you to adopt that working definition, or if not that exact one, one that fits your worldview a little better, whatever that is, I'm fine with that. But you'll see that using that definition gets us out of feels like, and it takes the subjective interpretation and those predictions of the future. I, I'm, I feels like I'm going crazy. That's a prediction of the future. It's an incorrect prediction of the future. But it, my definition takes all of that out of the equation, and that's really important. We got to get that stuff out of the equation uh, if we're going to make any sort of progress. So I urge you to adopt that definition. So to answer the question, what is depersonalization? My answer is it's a temporary change in the way my brain processes its perception of me. Uh, and it's only different and temporary. It's no better or worse. And it's not permanent. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to the next question. Why does it happen? Now, the reason why human beings ask why things happen is because we often has the, have this feeling that if we know why something happens, then we could somehow engineer things so that we can make that thing happen if it's a good thing, or we could stop it from happening if it's a bad thing. And sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not. So let's follow that logic and let's look at possible explanations for why depersonalization happens. Well, I think the first one is probably psychodynamic. There are psychodynamic theories out there that all revolve around things like defense mechanisms. We've all heard that phrase. You become depersonalized and we dissociate to protect ourselves from repressed memories of hidden, of past traumas. That's a very Freudian thing. Uh, those kind of things are associated with psychoanalysis. Uh, and while I'm not a psychodynamic guy, I'm a behaviorist, I will acknowledge that maybe that's true. There's kind of no way to prove it, but maybe it is true. But if we're asking why so that we can intervene and stop it from happening, then let's, let's go down that path. If that is true, then that puts us square in the realm of psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapies. And decades upon decades of practical experience show us that psychoanalysis and those type of therapies are the least effective intervention we have in the case of anxiety disorders. They are extremely ineffectual because they take a very long time they're not goal specific, they're open ended. You may lay on that sofa talking about how mean your mother was for 10 months or 10 years. We don't know and we don't know when it ends. So if we're worried about finding a cause so that we can stop it, the psychodynamic explanations don't really help us, right? So maybe they're true, but even if they are, what good does that do us? Like not a lot of good. So the next most common explanation is, is biological. Um, people will say, well, it, it must be chemical, right? It's chemical. Well, 
you know, this is going to sound kind of smart ass to say, but saying that depersonalization is chemical is like saying that water is wet. It's not news in any way, shape or form. We are physical beings in the world. And the way we express that physical uh, incarnation is in our brains, chemically, digital ones and zeros, right? So we are, we are a stream of biochemical ones and zeros. That's what our feelings and our thoughts and our, our emotions and ideas, that's what they ultimately boil down, boil down to physically. So it's no secret that everything that happens in our brains is chemical in nature. But knowing that it's chemical doesn't mean that that helps us in any way because while we may know a lot more about brain chemistry than we did 35 years ago or 50 years ago, we still don't know nearly enough to know exactly which of those chemical ones and zeros are to blame for, for depersonalization or derealization or any particular anxiety symptom. We just don't know. So regardless of what any drug company may want you to believe, we really don't know. And neuroscientists will say this every day. We're getting better, but we're still really, really, really far off from having any real answers. And since we don't know which chemistry is actually at play in these things, we don't have any real effective interventions. And when I say effective, my my criteria for an effective intervention, and I'll, I'll be honest, I mean medication, is one that has a specific predictable outcome that's well targeted and doesn't involve all kinds of other side effects that come with it. And right now we do not have that. So our inter, our medication, and I would say medication, even anything you swallow, whether it's a medication or an herb, doesn't natural doesn't always mean good or safe. Uh, so the things that we swallow to deal with these problems are like cleaning your oven with a flamethrower. That may work, but there's a whole slew of prices to pay for that clean oven with the flamethrower. Uh, and in my opinion, it's really not the best course of action. So forget the chemical part and I think what this boils down to is if you want to look at why does the personalization happen probably the most constructive thing we can do is to accept that we really don't know because otherwise we spend a tremendous amount of time and energy trying to find the cause so that we can somehow stop it from happening and honestly that becomes a colossal waste of time and energy and just leads to frustration and anger and disappointment and confusion uh, and, and a feeling of powerlessness because you search and search and search for this to swallow or that to swallow or oh it must have been a time that my teacher yelled at me and none of that ever turns out to be fixable or workable and so you just start to feel like you have no power over the situation and that's wrong so the most constructive thing we can do is just accept that at least today at 2015 we really do not know the exact mechanism of why these things happen to us see me in a hundred years maybe we'll know but for now let's accept that we don't know so the third question is then what do we do about it and just because we don't know why it happens doesn't mean we're powerless but i will say that the, the cheeky answer of you know in, uh, the question what do i do about it is that you do nothing uh, and i don't mean truly nothing what i mean is we don't do any of the things that we instinctually think we should do to react to our anxiety symptoms. So we do not fight against them. We don't flee. We don't try and avoid or distract. We don't try to ignore them. We don't try to run from them. And we certainly don't go into bracing, oh my God, what if mode, because those are the things that cause more problems. So when I say do nothing, I mean, you don't do any of the things that most people commonly do sort of by instinct or automatically as a knee jerk reaction to depersonalization or, or any other anxiety symptom. What we do do is more of an active nothing. And by active nothing, I mean, we have to work on things like relaxation breathing techniques. That's a skill. You have to practice it like learning how to ice skate. Progressive muscle relaxation. Another skill you have to practice like learning how to speak French. Uh, and you have to learn uh, work on meditation, which is calming your mind. Yet another skill you'd have to learn, like learning to play the trombone. So there are things that we can do that we do take an active role in, but it's sort of an active nothingness. So our overall goal with depersonalization is when it hits, we need to be able to put ourselves in the state of a relaxed body and a quiet mind. And that takes work. That's practice. Those are skills you have to work on. And then the wild card in there is courage, and I talk about that all the time. So you have to be willing to be really afraid of the symptom, at least in the beginning. Uh, but when you put all those things together, you work on those things, you accept the fact that depersonalization is just going to happen to you. You don't fight it, you don't try and stop it, you don't try and flee or distract or avoid or run. And instead, you kick in with that active nothingness, relaxing, breathing, calming your thoughts, being still, 
you will find that your episodes of depersonalization get shorter. Not immediately, so they're not going to go from lasting an hour to lasting 10 minutes immediately, but each time will get a little bit shorter and a little less severe. And once that happens, that is where the, pro the concept of experiential, experiential learning kicks in. And that's the miracle of the human brain because now you will learn, even though you're not trying to, but you're going to learn this through experience that, hey, wait a minute, if I do this, then it's not so bad. It, it actually does go away. And once you learn that through experience, that's when the fear begins to break down. And the trick here is not that we're trying to make depersonalization go away. We're not trying to make it go away. We're just trying to lose our fear of it. Once we lose the fear, because we understand that if we relax and do nothing, we're safe and it will go away. Once we lose the fear, that's when you win the war. So the, the short answer to it, what do I do about depersonalization, is you learn, note that you don't need to be afraid of it. That's what you do. And that's an active process. And we'll talk about the specifics of that down the road in, in extra in future podcast episodes and videos. So we're going to talk about the mechanics of breathing and relax, relaxing and all that good stuff. But in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. We're learning not to be afraid. And when you learn not to be afraid, that's when you begin to actually banish depersonalization and all your other anxiety symptoms from your life. All right. So let's recap here. What is depersonalization? It is a temporary change in the way my brain processes its perception of myself. It's just temporary and it's merely a change in state. It's not any better, worse, more or less dangerous. That's all it is. Why does it happen? Don't really know why it happens and that's okay because I don't want to waste a whole lot of time trying to find the cause so that I can fix it because I can't. And what do I do about it when it happens? Well, I actively do nothing. I actually learn the skill of doing nothing when it happens. Because when I do nothing, when I relax my body, quiet my mind, and learn to just be quietly courageous in the face of depersonalization, then my episodes become shorter and with less intensity, and suddenly I'm no longer afraid of it. So whether it happens or doesn't happen is inconsequential to me, and that is when suddenly it does begin to go away and it happens less and less. All right, so that kind of ties it all together. I hope this has been helpful. I really do appreciate you guys stopping by to watch and or listen. Again, I apologize for the silly car video, uh, but it's when I can do it. And please, if you have questions or comments, as I always say, hit the website, thatanxietyguy.com. You can find every way to contact me is right there. Reach out with anything you got, good or bad or otherwise. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you can comment right in the comments section of the video. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to the podcast and you're especially listening on iTunes, give me an iTunes rating. Hopefully you think it's worth four or five stars. Maybe take a minute and write a little review because if you're getting something out of the podcast, those are the things that help more people learn about it. And the reason why I do this is because I'm trying to help people. So that would be a huge help to me. I would totally appreciate it. So again, thanks for stopping by to listen and or watch. I will see you guys in the next episode. And I'll leave you with the same thought that I leave you with every time. And that is keep moving forward every day because every step forward is a good step forward. It doesn't matter how small it may be. All right. Have an awesome day. See you guys next time.